Gospel of Matthew, 15th chapter. Shouldn't be too hard to find. Matthew 15, and we're going to just lift two verses for your consideration this morning. There are many things we want to get done today, but we're just going to allow the Holy Spirit to have his way. Amen. As everyone found, if you don't have it, need some time, say, wait a minute. There are some Bibles here in the center section if you don't have one and would like to look at it for yourself or share with the neighbor. Gospel of Matthew, 15th chapter, verses 26 and 27. And we're going to um, read from the NIV. God's word says this. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. A very familiar passage of scripture. You may have heard this before. This is Jesus replying. Jesus is talking to this woman. He says to her, he replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And just for a short while, we want to speak from this thought. Crumbs from the master's table. And then crumbs from the master's table. When we think of the word crumbs, we think of things that are insignificant. We think of things that don't amount to much. We think of lack. We think of little. When we think of the word crumbs, we think of something that's set off to the side that nobody wants. It's lacking. It's not good for anything. You can barely even make use of it. When we think of crumbs, we think of something that's small, something that's little, something that can never amount to much. And when we think about crumbs, the first thing that comes to mind is, uh, uh, if you're like me, you're thinking about some bread or some cookies or some cake. And you know how when you go get a piece of it, or if it's in a container, when you pull it out, you see all these crumbs left, or if you have some bread, there's some bread crumbs left. Well, the definition, I looked it up, the definition of crumbs is a fragment of cake, cookies, bread, or something that amounts to very little. And so when we think about crumbs, we have the right idea. But how many of us know that big things come in small packages? Amen. Big things come in small packages. And if we know that to be true in earthly things, then how much more true is that of heavenly things when God is involved and when Jesus gets his hands on things? As a matter of fact, the Bible is replete. It has many uh, talks and discussions and scriptures about how when people gave Jesus what they considered just a little, he prayed over it and blessed it and broke it. And before you know it, it fed thousands and multitudes. So whenever we give to Jesus, he can multiply. He can make it bigger and better than what it used to be because nothing is too small in the hands of Jesus. If we give it to him, he can use it for his glory and for our good. So as we talk about crumbs from the master's table, if we don't understand anything else, our big idea is this. When adversity comes, don't run from God, but press into God even more. When adversity comes, don't run from God, but run into or to God, towards God, because he has more. When we run to him, he can do some things that we can't do, of course, so we need to take everything to him. And this statement is pretty much self-explanatory, but by the time we get to the end of today's message, it will come to life. That is my prayer, that this statement will come to life. So how do we get here? Uh, if we look at this text, it says that, this is Jesus speaking in verse 26. It says, it is not right to take children's bread and toss it to the dogs. And we don't know who this character is other than I just told you that it's a woman speaking. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. No, it says she there. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. So how do we get here? 
What happened to get us to this point? And I'm glad you asked that question. That's where context comes in. So the text are these two verses, but in order to paint the picture, I want to take you back to the 21st verse where we can find the context, the verse uh, that precede this to kind of give us some meat. So in verse 21, it says, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and, and Sidon. So leaving that place, so that would prompt our minds to, well, where was he? He was leaving. Jesus was in Galilee, around Galilee, and uh, around Nazareth and Genesaret. And he left that place. Well, why did he leave? Well, if you read the chapter before, chapter 14, we know that John the Baptist had just been beheaded. John the Baptist had just got killed. And because John the Baptist was killed, Jesus, you know, Jesus and John, they were close. They were, uh, how, how, how many months apart were they? Six months. They were six months apart because John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus. He was the one who predicted that would lead, would pave the way for Jesus to come. And so they were tight. They were, they were, they were really close. And when uh, John the Baptist died and was beheaded, Jesus, he felt it. So he left where he was to go to Sidon and Tyre. And what that tells us is that as we do ministry, whether we do it in church or whether we are in the world as marketplace Christians, many of us need to understand that, you know, God just didn't call ministers uh, to preach from the pulpit in the church. As a matter of fact, the ministers only preach from the pulpit in the church and we're doing God a disservice. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. The word is not meant to only be preached in church. The word is to be preached wherever we go because we carry the word. We carry the word. So there are marketplace Christians. Wherever you go on your job, when you go to King Supers, when you go to Safeway, when you go to Big Lots, when you go to the Dollar Store, man, when you go to all those other places, amen, wherever we go, we carry the gospel. When you go to McDonald's, well, I haven't gone this week because it's, you know, it's fast and Daniel's fast. When you go to school, wherever you go, we are to carry the message of the gospel with us. We are, we are God's feet and voice in the earth. And if we don't proclaim his name, then who's going to tell people about God? You know, we want people to be saved, but we don't want to say anything that will help people to find Jesus and get them saved. As Christians, we have to open our mouths and get to speak. So the first thing is says, uh, we learn here that when we are uh, doing work, ministry work, whether from the pulpit or from our jobs, we need to take time out and get some solace, get some rest, get some uh, respite. Because ministry, if you do it correctly, it will wear you out. It will wear you out. And so you have to take time and solace to seek God to get replenished. And this is what Jesus was doing. Jesus left. So for a time of reflection, a time to get replenished because he was hurting. And we cannot effectively minister if we've been hurt. Yes, we can minister, but we do it more effectively once we're healed. And that's what the respite and rest does. As we move on to verse 22, we see here that a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. From this verse, there's, there are several things, and God help me remember this by ABCD. A, the area. Uh, he showed me that while Jesus was in this place trying to get some rest, here comes this woman interrupting his nap, interrupting his leisure, interrupting his solitude. Anybody ever been interrupted when you're trying to get some rest? Amen. Those of us who have kids, you better raise both hands. Amen. Trying to get some rest, and here come the kids. Or the, or the phone is ringing, or something's going off to get up to, to disturb us. But uh, this woman, she came uh, seeking Jesus for something specific. She came seeking him. So she came to the area and where he was. Uh, the second thing B, she broke through barriers to get to him. So. Um, I wish I had time to explain all of this, but when this woman came to Jesus, there were several barriers that she broke. And she broke tradition, and she didn't care because she needed a breakthrough. So she was going to do everything she knew to do 
not worry about tradition or barriers to break through to get to Jesus because she knew that he held the answer to what she needed. And I would encourage us today to not allow anything to discourage us from getting what God wants us to have. She broke through the barrier of sexuality. Back in those days, women were considered second class. As a matter of fact, they were lower than, I'm sorry, they were lower than second class. So a woman was not even supposed to talk to a man. But this woman came to Jesus. Not only that, but she broke uh, national barriers. She was a woman of uh, Can uh, Canaan. She was a Canaanite. And Jesus is a Jew. Uh, if you're not a Jew, that means you are a Gentile. So if you're not Jew, you're Gentile. And this woman uh, came to Jesus, who was a Jew, and she's not, and she's going to request something. So she broke through national barriers. She broke through religious and uh, racial barriers and social and all those barriers because she needed something and she knew Jesus had it and she wasn't going to leave until she was blessed. She was not going to leave until Jesus blessed her. See, I love this because she cried out to the Lord. She cried out to him. She cried. She said, Lord, help me. My daughter is sick and Lord, if you don't do it for me, I, it can't be done. So she cried out. And no doubt, the disciples heard her. Now, whether the disciples were in the vicinity or not, that we don't know. But we do know that these disciples heard her crying out to Jesus because later on it says, uh, Lord, can you please shut this woman up because she's been bothering us. But she's crying out to Jesus. And no doubt there were others around too. And the point to be made is she cried out to him, not responsible. She didn't care what other people thought about her. She was going to cry out because she needed something. And if I have to speak out loud to get what I need from Jesus, I'm going to speak out loud. I don't care who's watching. I don't care who's looking. But I need something from God. And I'm not going to rest until I get it. And if I have to cry out and disrupt the peace, then that's what I'm going to do. Because I'm gonna, I need a breakthrough. I'm fighting some demons, and I need a breakthrough. So I'm going to cry out to God. I don't care who's looking at me, but I'm going to cry. And God says, are we willing to cry out to him for the things that we need? Or will we sit silently, suffering, and not saying a word because we're afraid what other people will think about us? Oh, she, she testified too long. Or she talked too long. Or he, he didn't, you know, he's always saying stuff. Why, why can't he sit down? Well, if you knew the demons that were chasing him, you'd be up too. Trying to get a breakthrough. Amen. D, I love this because when this woman came to Jesus, she broke through the barriers of tradition. She broke through the barriers of uh, social uh, issues. She broke through all those barriers to get to Jesus, not to ask a blessing for herself, but look at her request. She came to Jesus seeking a blessing for someone else. She came seeking a blessing for her daughter. And she went through all these barriers to get it. And I just want to know that when we go to God in prayer, are we so selfish that we're only going to pray for ourselves? Or are we going to try and get to Jesus on behalf of someone else? Because we can be uh, a bridge that will carry uh, whatever is needed to the other side and we would just be that advocate that stands in the gap for somebody else. She persevered through all of these things to get to where she was going. Somebody said she persevered. persevered. Amen. Verse 23. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, Lord, for she keeps crying out after us. So this woman came to Jesus, pouring out her, her spirit, pouring out her troubles, pouring out all of these issues that she was going through. She poured herself out to Jesus, and look at what Jesus did. He didn't say a word. This woman is screaming and crying out to Jesus, and he didn't say nothing. Now, come on, Jesus. Somebody said, come on, Jesus. This woman went through all that. Jesus, you ain't gonna say that to this woman. At least he could have said hi to her or something, you know. He didn't say nothing to her. And my question is, what do we do when we go to God and it seems as if God is silent? 
God showed me something. He revealed something to me. When God is silent when we go to him in prayer, it's possible that it could be that we are entering a test. Let me explain to you like this. Many of us remember back in school, some of us are still in school. Remember how we were in school and it was time for a test and the teacher or, or, or you know, the, the substitute teacher, whoever it was, they would come in, they would have the test ready in their hands, they would hand the test out, give you your pencils and stuff, and they would tell you to be quiet, be silent because it's a test, no talking. And even the teacher was silent because they were taking a test. Well, when we are tested in the spiritual, in the spiritual life, sometimes God is silent because we are entering a test phase and we can't talk while the test is in progress. And God is saying, even uh, in, in the earthly realm, if we are going to pass the test, we need to study before the test comes. If we're going to pass the test, hopefully we've studied before the test comes. So when, in, in life, when life tests us, sometimes God remains silent because we're in testing mode. And God is praying silently as our teacher, hoping that we have studied before the test comes so that when this test is over, we can pass through the flying colors and come out as pure gold. Somebody say amen. It's possible that when we are tested, God is silent because he's praying for us, hoping that we've studied so that when we come out of the test, we know that God is blessed. And somebody say, this is just a test. Amen. So I said, this is just a test. Tell somebody else, this too shall pass. Amen. We find here also, the disciples came and urged them, send her away, for she keeps crying after us. And what God told me to ask myself was, these disciples, because Jesus didn't say anything, so the disciples said, well, Lord, if you're not going to say nothing, uh, I, we know she's bothering you because she's bothering us. So send her away. And the question I have for the house is, when we are doing ministry work or trying to be led by God's Spirit, are we allowing other people to get in our ear? Or are we listening to the Holy Spirit? Because if we let other people get in our ear, no doubt uh, if they're not speaking the right thing, we can be set off course. And it will affect our destiny. So we've got to be careful about who we let in our circle to get in our ear because what gets in our ear eventually comes out of our hearts. And we need to allow nothing but the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. So be careful about who you, who you let in your inner circle. Amen. Verse 24. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now wait a minute. So now when Jesus finally does speak, he tells this woman, listen, I know you've come to me, but I can't help you. I can't help you because I've been sent on a mission. And I have divine orders to bless the house of Israel. So when he says that, what he's saying is, uh, I've been sent first to bring blessings to the nation of Israel, to the Israelites, to the Jews. I'm supposed to bless them first. So I can't, uh, I can't come out of divine order and mess things up and bless you just because you're coming to me. Because my uh, commission, my duty, my calling is to fulfill what God told me to do, and I got to go bless the Israelites first, so I can't give you what you want, because that's not my mission. Amen. Keep that in mind. This is what he said here. Perseverance and faith God honors. Verse 25. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. Now, we would have thought this woman would have surely have left by now. First, she had to cross all these traditions and barriers, and if that wasn't enough, after she poured her spirit out to God, to Jesus, he didn't say a word, so many of us would have probably just given up. Yeah, all right, if you ain't gonna bless me, then fine, I'm going back home. That's the attitude that I would have had, because I'm not gonna, you know, I'm only gonna do so much. If you keep telling me no, pretty soon, then I'm just gonna assume you're gonna say no, and I'm gonna go about my business. But this woman did not do that. She was not going to leave until Jesus blessed her. She was not going to depart until she got what she wanted. So Jesus says here, uh, well, she tells Jesus, the woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me. So the King James Version says, worship. NIV says she knelt 
But uh, the verse says in King James that she worshiped him. Now, she is falling down on her knees, worshiping Jesus, but yet this still didn't move him. Jesus was not moved by worship, but she was willing to go the extra mile to worship God to get what she wanted. Is there anybody in the house that's willing to worship God to get what you want? Is there anybody willing to worship God to get what you want? Come on, is there anybody willing to worship God to get what you want? I set us up. And that's what's wrong with the church. Because many of us only worship God to get what we want. Yeah, many of us only worship God to get what we want. How about worshiping God to give him what he wants? How about worshiping him to give him what he wants? He wants praise. He wants honor. He wants us to come to him and bless his name, whether we have a bank account that's full or whether we are looking for somebody to pour a hand out. No matter where we are in life, God says, bless me. I want you to, don't let your circumstances dictate your praise. Don't let your circumstances dictate your praise. Because when I get ready to bless you, I'm not going to allow your circumstances to, uh, to stop me from blessing you. Because God can bless you in the midst of your circumstances and change your circumstances. So why would we do anything less to not bless God because of our circumstances? He wants us to give him praise all the time, not just when things are well. Somebody say amen. This brings us to our text. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Now, this woman, she has been through barriers. She's been through tradition. She's been through uh, Jesus not saying anything to her. She's been through uh, the, the people talking about her because she was crying out. She's been through all of this stuff, and yet she's still here. And then Jesus has the audacity to call her a dog. Now, I want to talk to some sisters in the house today. We have any, any real sisters? If somebody call you a dog, amen. Y'all pulling off earrings. You getting your grease and your Vaseline together. Amen. Jesus called her a dog. I don't give stuff to dogs. Now, when Jesus said, when he talked about the children, he's talking about the nation of Israel. When he talks about dogs, he's talking about everyone who's not a uh, children of Israel. He's talking about the nations. So he was calling the children, Israel, and everybody else, dogs. He said, I'm not going to toss uh, crumbs to a dog. And she stayed right there, and she took everything that Jesus had to offer. He was testing her faith. He was testing her faith. And I believe this is a good point to tell the house, it's a good place to tell the house, that faith that is not tested is really not faith at all. We don't need faith when things are going well. We don't need faith to, to hope for things that we already have. But faith is to take place when all hell breaks loose. Faith is to take place when we can't see our way through. Faith comes in when we don't know what we're going to do, don't know how it's going to get done, but we're going to trust God that he's going to do what he said he would do. That's what faith is. Faith stands on the verge of nothing and is going to land on something because faith trusts God to get the work done. Faith trusts God. We don't need faith when we have everything. Faith comes in when we don't have everything, when we, when we don't know what's going on, when we're ignorant to the situation. That's when faith is really needed. Faith is not tested. It's not faith at all. And some of us are going through some tests. Some of us have some tests, job loss, unemployment. And I want to speak to someone in the house today to let you know that even if you lose your job, God is still your provider. God is still your provider. And I had to learn that the hard way. When I lost my job, uh, I loved God at the time I had my job. I loved him. I truly, truly did. But I think God removed that job from me because I was making it my source. God says, no, I'm your source. What I give you is just a resource. When God blesses us, he is our source. He gives us everything. And everything that God puts in place is for us to use as a tool. Jobs, cars, houses, whatever God gives us, God says, okay, 
I'm going to give them a little something to see how well they're going to use it, to see how well they're going to do it. And when I bless them with this and that and the other, are they going to use that for my glory? Or are they going to just use it for themselves? Whatever God gives us, we have to think about it as a resource. He's the source. He gives us everything else. So if everything else is taken away, and we have our faith and confidence in everything that he took away, we're going to be messed up. But if our faith is in God, we know that whatever God takes, God will provide. If he takes it from you, he'll give you something else to provide. We just have to be faithful away from it. This woman's statement, when adversity comes, she didn't run from God, she pressed into God even more. It's not right. In verse 27, so this is what Jesus said. And look at what she says in verse 27. She says, yes, it is, Lord. She said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. So when she said, yes, it is, Lord, she wasn't arguing with Jesus. She was agreeing with him. You have to read it from different translations. She was agreeing with him. Jesus said, you know, it's not, I can't take bread from the Israelites and give it to those who are not Israelites because that's not what I'm called to do. And, I, and she said, Lord, you are absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But then she goes on to add to that, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. So she was saying, Lord, I know that you, you, you're not purposed uh, to give me anything right now. And Lord, I'm not asking you for a full meal. I'm not asking you to set the table for me. I'm not asking you for all of this. Lord, I just want the crumbs that fall to the floor. And what she was saying was, Jesus, I know that you've come to the Jews and to uh, the Israelites, but Father God, I know that they, they, they disrespect you. They don't treat you like you're deserving of them. And so the blessings that you give them, they're not going to appreciate them. And so they're going to allow some of those blessings to be lost underneath the table. And Lord, while those, since you've come to bless and your blessings have been given, allow me to experience the blessings that other people want to throw away. And because, Lord, I'm hungry. And God wants to know, are we hungry for what he wants to give? Or are we going to sit at the table and just be disrespectful about the meal that God prepared for us? And if we don't like the food, it will fall to the table and somebody else will eat of our blessings. God wants us to know that when he blesses us, we should be appreciative of the blessings he gives us. And don't let any crumbs fall to the table. But this woman was saying, Lord, I know that you, they don't like you, they don't appreciate you. So, Father, I'm not, I'm not asking for the full course meal. Just let me have the crumbs that fall underneath the table. And what she was saying was, Lord, I know if you give me these crumbs, it may seem like a little, but Lord, if you give it to me, I know it will set me off. I'll be blessed. I'll be set up. I'll have more than enough. I'll be more than a conqueror. I know I can do all things through Christ, but you bless me, Father God. So there is no such thing as a crumb blessing because when God blesses us, it's a lesson. And when we've been blessed, we'll know that we have been blessed. Amen. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And I've been closing us when we close with this verse, verse 28. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted and daughter and then her daughter was healed at that very moment. Jesus gave her what she requested, and she was blessed, and her daughter was healed. Now, I've told you that God honors perseverance and faith. When we persevere, God honors that. But what I didn't tell you is how do we persevere? How do we get to the point where we have faith? Well, we do it through demonstration. We have to demonstrate the faith that we have by allowing it to work, by allowing God to work in us, and we work the faith he's given us. So the way to do it, Jesus said, woman, you have great faith. He didn't tell her you just have faith. He said you have great faith. And what God revealed to me is that when we are faithful to him, God will change circumstances. He will change the order of things. Remember in the beginning of the message where Jesus said, I'm not sent to you. I, I can't bless you right now. I cannot bless you because I've been sent to the house of Israel. So I can't bless you. But what did he do in this verse? He blessed her. Why? Because she had faith and because she persevered. Because she didn't give up when she heard the word no the first time or the second time or the third time. 
but she kept persevering. She kept having faith, and God blessed her as a result of her perseverance and her faith. And God wanted to tell the house today that if we are faithful to him and have faith in him, God will reverse circumstances. God will change conditions. Things that are set up against us that are impossible, God will make them possible because of our faith in him. Things that are set and designed to take us out, God will change circumstances when we have faith in him. God will change things. He will change people. He'll change places. He'll change whatever needs to be changed if we have faith. God will move mountains if we have faith. The problem is, how do we have faith? And I, you may think I'm preaching to you, but I'm preaching to myself. Sometimes we lose faith. Sometimes we're not as faithful as we should be. And if we're honest with ourselves, all of us have been there. We don't all believe and trust God like we should. And if we would say we do, then we're lying. You let, some, let a storm happen in your house and see where your faith goes. Let, let the doctors call you and give you a bad report. Let your children call you and, and tell you that something happened to them and they car accident or something. Faith will sometimes go out of the window. What we need to understand is that's what the devil is trying to do. Make our faith go out of the window. But Jesus is saying to us, keep the faith. No matter how difficult things are, you can lose your house. You can lose your job. You can lose your car. God forbid you lose a family member. But whatever you lose, don't lose your faith. Yes. If you have your faith, that can restore everything back to you. Don't lose your faith. Crumbs from the master's table. Yes. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this word. We pray, Father God, that it would have touched the hearts that needed to hear this word. Bless them right now, Father God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. As I look over the house, I believe everyone has already confessed Christ as Lord. If there is not one who has not confessed Christ, this hour is for you. Won't you come? Everybody's already confessed Christ. If you're looking for a church,